Sutra. Now, in the midst of dramas, how can you use your mind to make distinctions that are based on worldly sophistries, terms, and characteristics? That is like grasping an empty space with your hand. You only succeed in tiring yourself out. How could empty space possibly yield to your grasp? Commentary. The world honored one continues speaking to Ananda. Now in the midst of dramas, how can you use your mind to make distinctions that are based on worldly sophistries, terms, and characteristics? Why do you draw in false thoughts and use your mind? Why do you base your skill on false thought, worldly doctrines of spontaneity and causes and conditions are sophistries? Sophistries are clever discussions of unreal things. You use the terms and characteristics of sophistries to make distinctions about my wonderful drama, to make distinctions about my wonderful suragama samadhi. How can you do that? That is like grasping an empty space with your hand to use your mind which has false thinking. Your conscious mind that makes distinctions to fathom the wonderful suragama samadhi is like trying to grab hold of empty space and stroke it with your hand. How can you capture empty space? Were you to ask a child if an empty space can be grasped, even if the child would say it can't be done. What are you doing now is grasping an empty space. It is like a Teng Hua Feng who said, first capture empty space, then you can capture Teng Hua Feng. He said it to a ghost which had captured him. Upon being captured, he reasoned with the ghost, Wait a bit, can't you? He said, There's a more matter I haven't finished attending to. When I have finished that up, I'll accompany you to see King Yama. Who was Tong Hua Feng? He was a cultivator of the way, a monk with samadhi power. When he was in samadhi, the ghosts and spirits couldn't see him. But he was visible to the ghosts and spirits when he left the samadhi. That time he had left samadhi, and the ghost of impermanence paid him a visit. What is a ghost of impermanence? When your time comes to die, it is the friend who comes to accompany you to see King Yama. That friend came and captured Tong Hua Feng and said, Your life should end. Come with me to see King Yama. And he locked Tong Hua Feng up in handcuffs and iron chains. Tong Hua Feng said to him, Friend, don't be so impolite. I still have one thing to attempt to, and then I will go with you. The ghost thought, You're opposing me for having captured you. Well, it doesn't matter if I show you a little card to see. So he said, What did you have to attend to? Whereupon Tong Hua Feng folded up his legs into a full lotus posture, and as soon as he was settled, he entered Samadhi. The Samadhi he entered was the no thought Samadhi, just before he entered it. He said, Now go and capture empty space, and then you can take along Tong Hua Feng, he said. If you can capture empty space, then come back and take me to see King Yama. Once he had entered Samadhi, the ghost had no way of capturing him. So everyone should know that Samadhi power is extremely important. Samadhi power is not being turned around by things, but being able to turn everything around. Didn't it say earlier in the text, if you can turn things around, then you are the same as the first come one. Cultivating to develop somebody's power is the same. You have it no matter what circumstance you encounter. I will explain a doctrine to you which is not a joke, but is true. If a man truly has somebody's power when he sees a woman, no matter how pretty she is, he can refrain from moving his mind. He can avoid giving rise to emotional desire. That is somebody power if as soon as you see a woman, you grow unsteady and start to shake and a hand suddenly grows right out of your throat. That's lack of somebody power. 
We can switch the sentence around and say that is the same for women when they see men. They should remain in a state of unmoving suchness, and if they are able to remain unturned by the emotional desire, they have some idea power. That's just the first step. You shouldn't think that that is something extraordinary in itself. That's the first step. The first step is to gain the ability to not be turned around by emotional desire, so that seeing is the same as not having seen. You face situations without a mind. You're confronted with the experience and still haven't any mind. That is samadhi power. You can measure the extent of your samadhi power by yourself. For example, if you can remain unmoved when the emotional desire between men and women comes to mind, then you have a little bit of samadhi power. To take it further, if you can remain in the company of your girlfriend without the arising of the least incident, that is a genuine skill. But the skill is not easily developed. If you have that kind of samadhi power, you certainly can cultivate and develop a very indestructible body. If you like that samadhi power, what is to be done? Don't be satis satisfied with the status quo, saying, "I haven't got that much samadhi power, so forget it. I'm not going to cultivate. I'm just giving to it. That's useless. You're just writing for a phone. The less samadhi power you have, the more you must cultivate. For instance, I sit in meditation, and the pain comes. The more pain there is, the more I want to sit. I will force myself to do what is difficult." That is also samadhi power. You only succeed in tiring yourself out. The Buddha tells Ananda that using his mind to invent sophistries about the same nature is like trying to grasp empty space. All you do is toy bitterly to no avail. You wear yourself out and exhaust your own energy. You lose your strength. After all, if you continually pour an empty space with your hand, can you deny that your arm would get tired? Eventually, your hand would hurt and would start to ache from weariness. You need and clutch and grasp and can't get hold of empty space. You grasp it and there's nothing. You grasp again and again, there is nothing. It would truly be a case of having nothing to do. And going to look for something to do, and that's the way Ananda was. He didn't have anything to do. It was probably the case that, as a monk, he ate his fill, and for lack of anything to do, he began clutching at empty space. How could empty space possibly yield to your grasp? How could empty space comply so that you could catch it? Empty space is basically empty. How could you capture it? If there was something you could grasp, then it would not be empty space. There has to be a thing before you can grasp it. For instance, this cup. Because there is a cup, I'm able to grasp it. If the cup weren't there, you could grasp back and forth and up and down, and there still wouldn't be anything. So the Buddha likens Ananda, who develops his skill based exclusively on the conscious mind that makes the distinctions. To someone who grasps at empty space, the principle is the same: to just increase your own weariness, which is not of the least benefit to the self nature. Sutra Ananda said to the Buddha, "If the nature of the wonderful enlightenment has neither causes nor conditions." Then why does the world honored one always tell the bhikkhus that the nature of things derives from the four conditions of emptiness, brightness, the mind, and the eyes? What does that mean? Commentary: How much gold would you say Ananda has? He asks his teacher. He really tries to argue publicly with the Buddha more than anything else. It's like a game of chess. Ananda said to the Buddha. Won't honor one if the nature of the wonderful enlightenment, the same essence, has neither causes nor conditions. Then why does the won't honor one always tell the bhikkhus that the nature of seeing derives from the four conditions? 
Another is borrowing the Buddha's principles. It's you that said this, Buddha, not me. You talked about the nature of things that way. Listen to him. He's protesting against the Buddha. Ananda had got snucked left and right so many times he hasn't said one thing right that by now he's probably hid the list of everything. I'm going to have it out with the Buddha, so he says, won't honor one. You keep saying that the signature is complete with four conditions. So, And so why does the Buddha now say that it is not causes and conditions? He certainly must have had enough gold to fill the skies to be pro prompted to argue with the Buddha like this. What are the four conditions? Emptiness, brightness, the mind, and the eyes. What does that mean? How do you explain this doctrine? In the past, you explained it according to these four conditions, and now you are going back on what you said. How can you do that? Is it possible for the Buddha to say things which don't count? The Buddha doesn't lie. How can you say it is that way and now say it isn't? Yeah, you can see that meeting up with this kind of disciple is not an easy task. Thank goodness the Buddha is the Buddha. If it were I, I'd have no way to handle him. Sutra, the Buddha said. Ananda, what I have said about all the worldly causes and conditions has nothing to do with the primary meaning. Commentary, Ananda's ability in debate is so good that he has subdued the Buddha. The Buddha said, Ananda, what I have said about all the worldly causes and conditions has nothing to do with the primary meaning. It is not the principal doctrine. What I said then was a provisional and expedient. You should not think that the things I said then are true. At that time it was as if I were rearing, rearing little children by telling you to be good and not be rambunctious. When you grow up, you can be an official, you can do important things. It was an expedient and provisional Dumbledore. Doesn't it seem from the, the tone of what he says that the Buddha has been subdued by Ananda? In the Vimalakati Sutra, Manjushri Bodhisattva asks the layman, Vimalakati, what is the primary meaning? What do you suppose the layman Vimalakati said? Can you guess, if any of you know, then you are truly a present-day Vimalakati. Do any of you know what the primary meaning is? Anyone who has read the Vimalakati Sutra will know, but if I tell you, you should not go around posturing in front of people, imitating the layman Vimalakati's gesture because you haven't reached his status. Don't be like some old people who make the mistake are pretending to be what they aren't. Vimalakati closed his eyes and did not open his mouth. He didn't say a word. Manjushri Bodhisattva said, Oh, you understand. That's the way it was, but you can't do the same thing when you go someplace and someone asks you what the primary meaning is that is unacceptable. It's fine to know about it, but be to be aware of the principle, but you can't go about putting on airs as if you were the same as the Vimalakati. That is impermissible. The same is true when reading the Sikh Vajra Sutra, which contains a lot of principle. Sometimes people make vokpozen out of these principles. If you genuinely understand the doctrine, then it is alright, but it is not alright to indulge in vokpozen. I will repeat this because it is very important. You can't go around trying to carry on chen banter with people. What is chen banter? Someone points a finger or makes a fist or some other such gesture that is impermissible for you to do. Why? You haven't the experience. You are not enlightened. It's not you who can make these kinds of gestures. One who makes these kinds of gestures is one who is enlightened. One who is enlightened has the penetrating understanding of absolutely everything. I had an encounter recently with someone who, who was so confused that he acted like he was drunk and supposed himself to be enlightened. 
so i told him to explain the seven kinds of sutra titles and the six realization, uh, realizations and he couldn't come up with one title he could not complete one realization what enlightenment do you suppose he had attained if he were an enlightened person then even if he didn't know the answer to the question he would have been able to espout principle why because all principles come forth from the mind if he were an enlightened person this mind his mind would be full of light and he would have penetrated to the understanding of all principles so that even if he didn't know the particulars he could explain it with principle that's what is meant by enlightened so you decidedly cannot steep tea in cold water and drink the dregs someone who forces the issue and announces that he is enlightened is totally shameless completely without a sense of shame there can be no such people in buddhism they are a useless lot i tell you sutra ananda i ask you again people in the world that say i can see what is meant by seeing what is not seeing ananda said due to the light of the sun the moon lamps and lamps people in the world can see all kinds of appearances what is called seeing that is called seeing if it were not for these three kinds of light they would not be able to see commentary the buddha felt that ananda was his little cousin and he should always take pity on him so again he calls out ananda i ask you again child i will again ask you people in the world say i can see everyone says he can see the text does not have the buddha saying he can see it is each person speaking of himself what is meant by seeing what is seeing what is not seeing tell me the doctrine involved ananda has now heard the buddha subdued by him he has been victorious and so he doesn't stop to think he just speaks out ananda said due to the light of the sun the moon and lamps people in the world can see all kinds of appearances that is called seeing without them we can't see if it were not for these three kinds of light they would not able to see sutra ananda if it is called not seeing when there is no light you should not see darkness if in fact you do see darkness which is none other than the lack of light how can you say there is an absence of seeing commentary whenever ananda says something he contradicts himself he slaps uh, his own cheek as it were he op opposes he opposes his own principle thus he says that if these three kinds of light are lacking there isn't any seeing the buddha challenges him he is a essential point to say there is no seeing and ask you about that ananda if it is called not seeing when there is no light you should not see darkness didn't you say that in the absence of light shed by sun moon and lamps you cannot see in fact this doctrine has already been explained but it is to be feared that ananda despite his great learning no longer remembers it so the buddha repeats it for him since you say there is no seeing in the absence of light you should not see darkness in explaining the sutra i asked you earlier what a blind man sees and the answer was black is the same thing here seeing blackness is seeing too if in fact you do see darkness which is none other than the lack of light how can you say there is an absence of seeing you cannot argue with this theory because it has already been established that you do see darkness which is simply the absence of light you can't say it is an absence of seeing it's all right to say there is no light but you cannot say there is no seeing ananda has run into another snack sutra ananda if when it is dark you call it not seeing because you do not see light then since it is not light and you do not see the characteristic of darkness it should also be called not seeing thus the two characteristics would both be called not seeing commentary ananda if when it is dark you call it 
not seeing because you do not see light in a dark place you don't see light and you say this is not to see at all then since it is now light now you are in a time of, of light in the presence of lamp light sunlight moonlight and you do not see the characteristic of darkness it should also be called not seeing when the light comes darkness goes and you no longer see darkness by your reasoning there would be no seeing in this situation either thus the two characteristics would both be called not seeing the two characteristics that have been discussed light and darkness would both be not seeing right is that what you mean sutra Although these two characteristics replace one another, your seeing nature does not lapse for an instant. Thus you can know that there is seeing in both cases. Now how, then, can you say there is no seeing? Commentary You see the Buddha is a great debater, and now you would probably be victorious in debate whoever you debated with. Although these two characteristics replace one another, the two characteristics of light and darkness contend with each other. Light claims that it is the seeing, and darkness contends that it is the seeing. Ananda, you say that neither one is the seeing. What is actually the case? Your seeing nature does not lapse for an instant. The succession of light and dark does not affect your seeing nature's ability to see. It is certain that your seeing nature does not increase or decrease. It is neither produced nor extinguished. It is not the case that your seeing nature temporarily disappears. Thus, you can know that there is seeing in both cases. You see light and you see darkness, and you can't say that either one is a case of not seeing. How then can you say there is no seeing? Since there is seeing in both cases, what do you say is not seeing? Speak up. He questions a level deeper. Speak up. Sutra. Therefore, Ananda, you should know that when you see light, the thing is not the light. When you see darkness, the thing is not the darkness. When you see emptiness, the thing is not the emptiness. When you see solid objects, the thing is not the solid objects. Commentary. Therefore, Ananda, because of the doctrine just explained, you should know that when you see light, the thing is not the light. When you look at light, your, look, your looking is certainly not the light. Your seeing nature is certainly not the light. It certainly is not that your seeing nature follows after the light and turns into it, that your seeing nature is turned around by that state. When you see darkness, the thing is not the darkness. When you look at blackness, your seeing certainly is not the blackness. Your seeing still has still not changed. It is the same as the seeing that is light. It is identical without any distinction. When you see emptiness, the seeing is not the emptiness. When you look at emptiness, your seeing certainly is not turned around by the emptiness. It does not run after emptiness. When you see solid objects, the seeing is not the solid objects. When you see places where there are solid objects, it certainly is not that your seeing follows after that and becomes a solid object. It cannot be turned around by that kind of external situation. It cannot be shaken by external things. It is your everlasting, unchanging seeing nature. Sutra, having realized these four meanings, you should also know that when you see your seeing, the seeing is not the seeing to be seen, since the former seeing is beyond that later, the later cannot reach it. That being the case, how can you say that your absolute intuitive perception has something to do with causes and conditions, or spontaneity, or that it has something to do with mixing and uniting? Commentary, having realized these two four meanings, these are the four meanings spoken of above the four causal conditions by which the seeing nature is accomplished. Now that you have realized that the seeing nature is not contingent upon the four aspects of light, darkness, emptiness, and solid objects, you should also know that when you see your seeing, the seeing is not the thing to be seen. Here the first seeing refers to our genuine seeing. 
true perception and the second seeing refers to the seeing essence which although it is also said to be a genuine seeing is ever so slightly false the first seeing is a pure seeing it is a genuine true seeing the second carries with it a bit of falseness so when your genuine seeing is able to see the false seeing the seeing is not the seeing your genuine seeing is apart from all characteristics with substance it has no substantial characteristic there isn't anything at all so it is said the seeing is not the seeing no seeing is accomplished since there is basically nothing at all you cannot give it a name this is a point which is called separation from the spoken word it is said the mouth wishes to speak but is at a loss for words the mind wants to set upon conditions but reflection ceases the mind wants to think but has no way to do so this is to be apart from the mark of the spoken word you cannot speak of it and apart from the mark of the written word it cannot be represented by any word the path of words and language is severed the place of the mind the place the mind can go is extinguished the way of words and language is gone the mind has no place to go this means that the places where the mind thinks are gone so at this time it is said that the seeing is not the seeing this doctrine is not at all easy to understand but also if you are familiar with the buddhist studies it is very easy to understand since there isn't anything at all how can you also say that the seeing is causes and conditions or that it is spontaneous seeing since the former seeing is beyond the latter the latter cannot reach it since your seeing is different from the seeing your seeing cannot catch up to it there isn't anything so what are you looking for the latter cannot reach it means that your false seeing cannot see it what is the seeing you cannot see it is your genuine seeing that being the case how can you say that your absolute intuitive perception has something to do with causes and conditions or spontaneity or that it has something to do with mixing and uniting why do you still want to say your seeing essence the absolute intuitive perception is the causes and conditions that i spoke in i spoke of in the past why do you bring that up as a comparison and why bring up a comparison with the spontaneity touched by the externalist sects and why bring up the characteristics of mixing and uniting by saying that everyone mixes together in a mixed up union the characteristic of mixing and uniting is like a when chaozi chinese revivalists break up when you buy them you can't distinguish them one from another the buddha tells ananda that when he spoke the drama of causes and conditions it was for the sake of those who had first begun to study people of the small vehicle that is the provisional vehicle of the south hearers and the conditioned enlightened ones and also for the adherents of externalist sects to refute the doctrine of spontaneity now i am explaining the suragama sutra in order to manifest and display the great suragama samadhi that kind of wonderful meaning absolutely cannot be compared to causes and conditions how can you still bring up causes and conditions and compare it to the primary meaning how can you compare it to the great suragama samadhi that's like mistaking copper to gold you are too attached you can't think like that 